Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. My guest this week is Josh Jennings from Blaze TV and Radio. My chat with him starts next. But first, I want to talk to you about getting ready for the holidays and what's going to be in your coffee cup for things like Thanksgiving. We're less than a month away. You got a lot to prepare for. Get the coffee checked off of your list. And did you know that every November and December, Butterball fields over 100,000 phone calls at its turkey hotline? And those calls are placed by so many great people in aprons that are cooking for people like me and you. Trust me, you don't want me anywhere near a kitchen on Thanksgiving. I'll be happy to, to sit off to the side and, and drink APR coffee. I'll do that. That's my contribution. But uh, typically, between 50 and 60 million Americans travel for the Thanksgiving holiday because they heard someone else was doing the cooking. Anyhow, uh, get ready for the holidays with APR Coffee's first Thanksgiving blend. Pumpkin spice flavored brew is what it is. It's a full city roasted coffee that will go good with whatever your holiday plans are. And save 10% from APRCoffee.com when you use promo code ATM at checkout. That's APRCoffee.com, promo code Keith. You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Josh Jennings is my guest on this edition of At The Mic. Josh is one of those many co-workers of mine who I pass in the hallway all the time, rarely find myself just stopping and having a conversation with him because, you know, we're always busy heading in one direction or another. Well, today that changes as Josh sits down with me and we find out that he's had some very interesting experiences that defy explanation. Uh, he's a talented opera singer. What? And of course, I have him sing for us, so you'll want to be listening for that. I try to convince him to get into an iconic band that, uh, in my never humble opinion, uh, everybody should enjoy. Uh, so our conversation begins right now with Josh Jennings here on At The Mic. Uh, a co-worker of mine at The Blaze. Indeed. Someone that I seriously never cross paths with in this building. <laughs> like, yeah. I see you, I know you, but... We, we, are, just... we are ships passing in the day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There, that's, that's well said. Yeah, we've both been up here for quite a while, but... We just never seem to be working on the same things. You know right, what I mean? Right. So we just, uh, and it's such a, a, a cavernous building. That, yeah, yeah. You know, I could literally be living on the other side and you wouldn't necessarily know. Oh, uh, I actually do. <laughs> I live upstairs. Uh, I actually do have a cot in my office upstairs. Oh, that's fantastic. And, 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 and no windows in the office. And, oh, you know, man. When, when you work the shift that I do, you know, sometimes you got to catch a little shut eye, you know? Absolutely. So you were born in Wichita, Kansas. I was. And so you grew up Ark City, Kansas. Is that near Wichita or somewhere yeah, else? Yeah, it's about uh, 45 minutes to an hour south. Okay. Depending on how you drive. Uh-huh. And, Fast. Uh, yeah, if it's fast, it's 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like me coming to work in the mornings. People say, like, how long does it take you to get, because I live so far out. I'm like, well, if I just got a ticket, it takes me 45 <laughs> minutes. If it's been a while since I got a ticket, ah, 32-ish. Yeah, yeah. I could cut it down <laughs> to 20 if I mounted a couple of rocket launchers on the front of the car. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you have two younger sisters so you're the oldest I do. Yep. yeah okay yep. uh how much older than them are you we we're stair steps so we're basically uh a, for most of the year we're all three two years apart so okay yeah i was i was two when my first sister was born and mm -hmm. then i was four when my second sister was born all right very cool now did you pick on them or protect them growing Merc up? mercilessly picked on them I uh i probably that. would have protected them also uh, had I ever had the opportunity to do so, but no, I was, I was not always the best brother. We would walk to school sometimes, and I made them march in formation like we were military. Oh, yeah, oh, that's kind of cool. Did, yeah. did they go on to join the military at all? No, no. In fact, okay. they probably didn't specifically because they <laughs> they got PTSD already. Right, so. right. So you've had your hand in a lot of stuff around this building. Mm. Um, walk everybody through all of the stuff that you've been involved with and what you're doing now here at The Blaze, man. Uh, all right. So I, I guess uh, probably about three years ago, uh, there was a show on The Blaze uh, that was uh, Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. Yeah, Andrew Heaton was a, a previous guest on this podcast. He was. In fact, his was uh, the first interview that I heard oh, cool. listening to your show. And all right. It introduced me to it, and I, I've been listening ever since. Yeah, yeah. So he went on to do his own thing, Yeah. And but you stayed behind. 
Correct. And you've been doing stuff here. Yeah. So I, I produced for his show first. Uh, he and I go way, way, way back. We're, mm. We've been friends for probably 20 years. Oh, we, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. We, we met in high school. We, we didn't go to the same high school, uh, but we met in, in the two nerdiest ways that you can meet. No, I'm going to love this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we both uh, were pages for our House of Representatives. Wow. And that's where we met the first time. Nerdtacular, but Big right- time up my alley yeah 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 <laughs> we were oh it's and it's better like we met there and then we actually sort of became friends because i sat down and had lunch with him one day and we talked about star trek the whole time so hold on that a was, second hold on was andrew heaton eating alone in the yes. co- congressional cafeteria <laughs> yes he was <laughs> and you went up and you said hey i did you look like you need a friend yep we sat down and talked <laughs> star trek for for an hour while we ate uh, lunch and oh, that was cool. that was the beginning and then i met him again later that same summer completely by accident um at a uh, a young writers conference and so, huh. uh, yeah, very, very nerdy. And then after that, it was kind of like, well, it must be destiny. So that's cool, man. Yeah, we've been right. friends ever since. So, so when he um, got the show on the Blaze, he wanted me to come produce for him. So I did. Um, had you done anything in broadcasting before? I had not. Oh wow, no. Okay. Uh, we we had done. We've done. He and I are both consummate writers. We've been writing since we were very young, and so we've worked on some projects together. We uh-huh. filmed a um, like a one hour uh sketch comedy special oh cool at one point but uh but no i i had not done anything in broadcasting um so i came here did that and then when that show ended um i i got pulled into glenn beck's office and he said i would like you to uh write uh, ad copy for me um wow and he said (laughs) i'll never forget this uh glenn says um he says now listen you're a real writer and most real writers, when you ask them to write ad copy, want to put a gun to their head. <laughs> I said, not me, Glenn. <laughs> uh-huh. And so I've been doing that ever since. That's wow. been my main job. I, I do write uh, for, for Glenn's. Um, I mean, I write quite a for several shows, but my main focus is writing for Glenn. Okay. So, so, so when, when, when people hear Glenn Beck on his radio or TV shows in reading a commercial mm-hmm. uh, that script was written by one josh jennings that is correct oh, cool yeah. man that's yeah, pretty, pretty cool. much uh almost everything that he does in terms of of any yeah any any advertisements okay so I, I write pretty much all of how it. how much leeway do you get as far as personalizing the ad copy and, and stuff like that you know it's it's funny <laughs> i there have been a few things <laughs> over the last couple of years where uh, I'll get like a note or, <laughs> or a uh, please don't do that again. <laughs> oh, really? But they're very, very, <laughs> they're very rare. Do you, uh, do you remember any specific instance that oh, you're uh, at liberty to discuss here? Um, <laughs> where where you got admonished? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I it's I'm way more likely to get admonished for making a mistake than I am for I see. going too far. I'm I, I'm sure I've I, I, there are instances that nothing comes to mind, but I've I've done things like. Um, one time, not all that long ago, actually, I, I actually, um, switched to, uh, to sponsors so that he was reading about one and the name of the other was in there instead. Uh, that one was, that was, that was one where I got a note afterwards. I'm oh, like, oh yeah, I should never do that again. No. So he's, he's, he's pimping one product, right. but it's got a wrong name. Uh, oh <laughs> yeah. brother. I mean, okay. Gosh, that had to be a rough day. It was a, it was not a pleasant <laughs> day. I mean, I, to be honest, like Glenn was, he made a joke about it afterwards and, uh, it was fine, good. But, but you know, I take my job seriously. Yeah. So I, I don't care to make those mistakes very often. I mean, that had to be embarrassing on some level. Is that the most embarrassed you've ever been though? I oh, mean, is there anything gosh. else that sticks out? I mean, uh, as, uh, with that, um, because you left that blank when I sent the email. I, I don't know. know. If, I don't know if you just couldn't come up with something, or you don't want to discuss no, it. it. Is it traumatic? More, so you, the the question was like, what what's the what's most embarrassing most, yeah. moment in life? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't answer it because I there are so many that I <laughs> wasn't sure I could pick I the most embarrassing. <laughs> I've had uh, I've had all sorts of embarrassing things happen to me over the years. Um, uh, <laughs> you know things. Everything from the the standard, you know, garden variety. Oh, I ripped my pants in public. Right, or, right, right. You know things like that. To um, I I I, oh, I know put my you... foot in my mouth so often. Oh, don't we all? Yeah. I mean, seriously, <laughs> don't we all? But one of your earliest memories. 
I don't know that it's embarrassing just because you were so young, hmm. but tell us about the time you got stuck in a phone booth. Ah, yeah. Uh-huh. This this is this probably is my earliest memory. I was uh-huh. very very little. My parents uh, for a summer ran a uh, a KOA campground up near Yellowstone in uh, Montana. Love it up there. Yeah, beautiful. And um, and. I just have this memory where my dad, I was with my dad and and he had some other friend with him and we pulled up to a gas station and back in those days, kids. I was about to say, I almost feel like we have to, to explain to, to some portion What's of the audience. Booth, yeah, what are they talking about a phone booth? Yeah, so what it is, it's a freestanding, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, building. Yeah, it's that, like a little closet. Yeah, a little closet, a closet. Yeah. In, in, it's in a parking lot or, or near a building outside, kids. And there's a telephone in there, and you yeah. go in there, and you make you put coins in the little thing. It used to be a quarter, then thirty five, and anyway, yeah, you make phone calls. I'm, I miss them. Yeah. I miss seeing them, even though I didn't really use them all that much. I miss them. I wish they'd come back. Yeah, I think the most fun with with uh, those kind of phones. There was a payphone at my middle school, and I remember there was a trick. I can't remember what it is now. There's not a life skill that would even be useful if <laughs> if, if 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 the if the phones were still out there, but you could dial something and and quickly hang up and make the phone ring oh and yeah. i just i just remember i was in sixth grade and i did this like comedy routine for my classmates we were waiting for some production something to start and i just kept acting like i was talking to somebody and then i'd hang <laughs> up and i'd step away and i'd get about three feet away and then it would ring again i'd be like oh my gosh they keep calling me back oh that's and great i just i can't remember the little trick to do that but boy that was a fun time ironically you could probably google it <laughs> You, you're right, it's, it's right. Probably there. Thank you. Yeah, 1987. I didn't have uh, access to the old Google. You had to remember that stuff. Right. But I'm sorry to derail the story no, here. No, no, but no. so you were a small child. You were at a KOA campground in Montana, and there was a phone booth. What happened? I so I walked into it, and and again to to sort of explain for people who aren't old enough to remember these, uh, the way that the door works on a phone booth is that it, it's it's sort of uh, you you push it inward mm-hmm. on its on its hinge. And I did that, and then I got in, and I shut the door, and then I had no idea how to get out. And uh, I panicked, oh. and it, it, I must have been, I, I was probably only two, so I was very tiny. Yeah. But I knew enough to know, or I thought I knew enough to know, that if I could get up to the phone, and I could, like, dial 911, or I don't know that I processed a 911, but <laughs> that I could call for help. Somebody as a lifeline there. Yeah. Right? But I was too short to even reach the oh, phone. Oh, no. <laughs> you had to be terrified. There was a big fat phone book hanging down on a chain. You remember those? Yes, I do. And so I was trying to grab that to like repel or not repel, I guess, like climb up the uh-huh. up the side of it oh, no. to get to the phone. It didn't work. Uh, and eventually my dad came out. And the last thing I remember was that he was laughing as he let me out. Because <laughs> your instinct would be, all right, I just got to push on this door. Right. But no, you were just well, making yeah. it even more. And it's Close. hinged in the yeah. middle of the door, so even if you pull on the door, yeah, yeah. it doesn't do anything. You have to pull it like in a special way to get uh-huh. it got to kind of accordion in, you know. Wow. So that yeah, had to be great first memory, right? Right, right. No, I'm just trying to think of my earliest traumatic memory. I guess I was probably about three, two mm-hmm. or three, just like you were talking about with the phone booth. And my mom and I were riding the Snow White ride at Disney World. And I told her I didn't want to do it. I, I forgot why. I just didn't want to. And she's like, that'd be fun. It's Snow White. <laughs> anyway, and we get to the very end, and she she made the mistake of saying, see, that wasn't so bad. And I can't imagine what compelled the designers of the Snow White ride at Disney World, which is not this way anymore, I don't think. It's been a while. Um, but the very last scene, before you're exiting the ride, there are all these little demons laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine like a wall full of little devils? <laughs> and the ride stops right next to them. Yeah. And like, then... and I'm ter- I'm like two or three <laughs> years old, and they're right there, loud. I, I'm, they're, I, I'm freaking out. It's permanently I, etched on your. It mind. sure is, and I don't let my mom live that down. Yeah. And so I have a visor with me, and I just chew it. I mean, it's just got teeth marks all in it within like 60 seconds. And finally, I get so fed up and, and, and terrified that I, I take matters into my own hands. And we are literally, 
you know, five feet from the door, and I just shove open the door. My mom's like chasing after me, like, get in the car, you're gonna get run over. And I just push it open, and then everybody that's standing in line who is delayed because the ride is now stuck, right. they break out into applause, and it was a fun <laughs> moment there. But I'm telling you, I would say the majority I have to go back and do the math, and I'm not going to, but it just seems like so many of our very early memories were of the traumatizing variety. Mm, yeah, you know? yeah. So. It's the it's the, the things that stick out. I mean, you're, I, I, I don't, this is sort of tangentially related, but um, one of the things that I uh, recently learned, you know that, that, that your brain doesn't actually stop forming until you're about 25 years old. Your prefrontal cortex right. is still forming until you get about that age. Okay. Um, and something that, that, Everybody notices this idea that time seems to go faster the older you get. Yeah. And we all sort of attach this kind of mortality element to it, which is appropriate. That like, oh, we're getting one step nearer to death, so everything speeds up. Well, it's actually, it's it, it, from, a, from a scientific point of view, apparently, what is actually happening is that when you're very young you are absorbing far, far, far more information in a, it, it, throughout your day um, than you are when you get to be our age mm. because your brain's still forming. You're still learning all of the, the basic things that we sort of take for granted and don't even think about because they're just filed away uh, right now. So, I mean, you're still learning your language. You're still learning what you know what what a car is what it does all this stuff you, that, that you and i we don't even think about now because it's just it's in cold storage up here uh -huh. and so the perception of time is moving more slowly when you're younger is literally because you're absorbing so much more information huh. and uh i just i find that fascinating that so, is yeah. yeah no i can attest to the older you get the faster it seems the time <laughs> yeah. marches on and it's very depressing i i do dwell on that kind of stuff it's, and it's not healthy yeah it is it's scary sometimes mm -hmm. i mean how fast a year will go by i mean not to not to bring all the pandemic crap into this too much but like did i mean did you notice how fast 2020 just shot by sure and uh and you know 2021's now well over half done it's yeah. crazy to me so eventually you did escape the phone booth. I did. You uh, had a childhood. I did. You eventually go to Northwestern Oklahoma State University and you majored in vocal music. Yeah. So were you planning to become a singer or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh -oh. That's a, yeah, that's a, so yes and no. Uh, I, I knew from the age of 10 that I wanted to be a writer. Um, what kind of writing? Uh, not, well, when I was 10, it was like, I'm going to write books. Okay. And um, I have. I've written four novels. I've written, I don't know, a How can people find them? short stories. Uh, they can't yet. Okay. <laughs> I, I've taken them off of, uh, I, I, I had like tried self-publishing because I got frustrated with the publishing process sure, in my lot. 20s. Um, but I took them off because, one, they're, they're very dated. Um, I, I literally, one of my first like full like adult novel was, um, a zombie apocalypse novel. Oh, nice. And there's sounds 50, like reality today. 50 billion of them out there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> so I just, oh, I, so that's a genre that's kind of saturated now. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And it wasn't when I started it, but you know, it, 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 it's just something that like now it's, it's a trunk novel. So I am working on a new one, uh, and I will, uh, Mm. Uh, I'll let everybody know about yeah. that uh, when it when it gets a little closer to completion. But I, I I knew that I wanted to be a writer when I was ten. That just became my life goal. Um, when I went to college, uh, I thought, well, how does one major in being a novelist at college? One doesn't, so one should find something you know right. really useful to do. Uh -huh. So I picked the arts, obviously, uh, and and went with a music major because that was where I got the most scholarships. Um, however, I've always loved music. I was in a lot of um, theater productions and stuff in high school, and so I, I thought, well, I, I I basically was talked into it by my professor, my oh, wow. music professor, who, who, to his credit, was a huge influence on me uh, in a lot of ways. But uh, during that time, I was learning uh, how to sing opera, and wow. I was in a couple of operas, and I did actually kind of think, well, maybe... I'll go be an opera singer. Yeah. Uh, totally did not happen. 
Oh wait, before you <laughs> before you keep going, you, you know there's going to be a follow up here, right? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, I want to hear some opera. Oh lord, anything? You, do you like the Pavarotti? Uh, I enjoy Pavarotti. I'm not a I'm not a tenor, so I I'm a, I'm a oh okay. No, I'm a baritone. I I have a. I, I I'm 37 now, so my range isn't what it was when I was uh, 27. I but because because um, because my my one two punch on the questions here was going to be do you, do you do you like Pavarotti right and do you like U2 and I, <laughs> if the answer is yes to both, then I was going to have you sing some Miss Sarajevo here because that's oh, really Lord. the only opera song that I ever listened to. <laughs> I I I, uh, I don't know you two's work very okay, well. Okay, all right, all right, well, I'll let you pass then on, yeah, that, on that specific I, uh, request I of have, mine. <laughs> I, I I I respect people who like you two, but to me, it's elevator music. Whoa, except, whoa, whoa! This interview is derailing yeah, quickly. Right. <laughs> except <laughs> for uh, <laughs> two shots of happy, one shot of sad. I oh, love Luke that Sinatra, song. Uh, Yes, Fun stuff there. that that I love, but uh, the rest of it, eh. I'll think about what to to sing, and perhaps uh, here in a bit, I can, I can conjure up something. Um, do you do you have a preferred language? Because uh, I I learned to sing in a fair number of languages. Um, uh, they don't say like Pakistani or something uh, like that. Okay, I have no so idea. what are the options here? Because I, I I never even thought of that. So uh, let's see. Gosh, I, I never learned... even thought you have to know languages as well as be talented. You with the have vocals. to learn how to how to pronounce languages. Right. I sang. I've sung plenty of things that I had no idea what I was saying. Oh no. Oh no. You just had to take the word of whoever was telling you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, let's see. There was there was uh, French. There was Italian. There's German. Um, I guess Italian is your default, right? Italian is kind of the opera? what everybody thinks of when they think of opera. All yeah, right, all right. And so uh, I'll, I'll bust some of that out uh, later in the interview if that's all right. I got to think back and you gotta think remember of some of it. Do you want me to print up some lyrics for you or something? Oh, yeah. we, we can do that. Okay. <laughs> no, I guess let's see. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you. I'll give you a couple of bars. Here. You sure? Is this sure. a good time? No, no, no. Because I'm making a note to remind you if yeah. you want me to wait. <laughs> no, it's good. It's okay. uh, without warming up. Yeah, yeah. And careful with the microphone. You don't want to peg yeah, the levels. Yeah, I'll pull back a little here. <laughs> Yeah. Um. <laughs> just cussed me out in song didn't you you're damn right i did <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome man good oh, job thank you. Thank you. seriously what 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 uh song was that do you know uh that is uh uh ombra my foo from uh the opera xerxes by oh wow oh uh, i want to say um what'd you sing though like what did you say uh oh no idea uh, he's singing <laughs> I know he's singing. It's something about uh, love. I think the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Oh, no, okay. it's, it's like a. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's what good it's job, about. man. Okay, no, well, I can see why you went to school to do that. It was definitely a talent there. Um, that's that that is. I'll just say I was better 15 years ago. Oh, I understand. <laughs> I, I, you could you could you could say that about anything and apply sure, it sure. to anyone. Yeah. You know, yeah, that yeah, I was better at that 15 I was, years. I was ago. better at that when yeah. I was practicing every day. But yeah, uh, yeah still got, got some pipes. That's cool. Yeah, so. You've held numerous jobs throughout mm. your life. Have you ever had the occasion to really break that talent out uh, outside of this podcast if it wasn't a music-related uh, themed job? Oh, if it wasn't a music-related job. Okay. Um, like, I, okay. I, I do have one. Uh, yeah? No, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I, was with a, uh, I was with a church group one time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were, I don't know, some some function. We were out at a restaurant, and uh, as we were leaving the restaurant, we'd been talking about it, uh, and I just brought up that I had sung. I'd been in a couple of operas, and they, they were like, oh, you got you to gotta sing for us. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So we go outside, and we're standing out on the sidewalk, and it's a, I don't know, there's like 15 people in this group, and they, they keep insisting. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, fine. So I start singing something. And literally, one of the guys in the group grabs his hat off and puts it on the ground, no, uh, and everybody starts throwing money. Yes, in there. yeah. I was like, yeah, <laughs> all right, uh, you should you should go hang out next to the Ranger Stadium and after I, games. You know, I've thought people, about that. I've right? thought about just going out and being. They call those people buskers, right? Like uh, they yeah. take like a guitar out and go yeah. sing or something like that. But do they? Um 
do they get clearance by the city to hang I out there no or do you idea. just claim a corner he's got to be able to run yeah when the fuzz shows up oh well, <laughs> well no no because when i see him it's like you got the police guiding uh, foot oh, traffic right, across right. the way and the guy with the saxophone is right there on the corner so i just wonder if it's uh, maybe he's cutting the cop in that's you it. Know, i think you, <laughs> you you figured that one out absolutely so you've been a explain to me what this is what is a paraeducator for an alternative school for troubled kids? I understand, obviously, you're, you're educating troubled kids, but what's that mean, paraeducator? So it's, um, I, I, when I was in college, I was, uh, you know, not just getting a music um, performance degree, I was also getting a music education degree, the, the, the sort of uh, day job that everybody t- tells you not to quit yeah. <laughs> uh, until your dream, you know, your ship comes in yeah. or whatever, uh, was going to be uh, being a teacher. I dropped out of college, and so I did not have a teaching certificate. I didn't have a degree to teach, but I was still kind of working on it in dribs sure. and drabs. So a paraeducator is kind of a, an assistant to a teacher. Mm-hmm. They do some, it depends, it also depends, like it varies from school to school what they do, but but they'll they'll do some teaching um, they'll do, uh, you know, clerical work f- that that needs to be done for the teacher, things like that. Okay. Um, in my particular case, because I was at a school that was for, you know, kids who had uh, troubles, we we had uh, basically two wings of the school. One was the kids who had mental problems, mm-hmm. let's say, and then the other one was for kids who had uh, lots of run-ins with the law. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my side of the school, I mostly dealt with the kids who were kind of, they had really troubled backgrounds, Mm -hmm. uh, really awful home, uh, life situations. A lot of times, um, I heard, I heard some really dark stories, uh, Mm -hmm. about kids that, that, you know, had really rough, um, lives. And Mm -hmm. so I, I, taught them, uh, along with the person who was the actual teacher in the room. But, you know, we also, I mean, sometimes your job was to kind of be a counselor. Sometimes your job was to, you know, be the disciplinarian. Like it, it really just kind of depended on the day, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a good job. I loved it. I loved the people I worked with. I liked the kids. You'd, you'd have days where literally like we had security guards and they would have to sometimes haul kids kicking and screaming. Yeah. I've seen kids in what do you call the, the, um, straight jacket, straight jacket oh, type thing. We had a padded room uh, that we would have to throw oh. them in sometimes if, it, if they got too violent and we're going to hurt themselves yeah. or hurt someone else. Yeah. Um, the police sometimes showed up. It was a, uh, an interesting place to work. Probably not a lot of opportunities to break into an opera. Yeah, <laughs> not too many, not too many. But uh, you know, I learned plenty of rap lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I love this. You um, were a school district lawn maintenance guy. Yes, best and, job. Yeah, ever. that's what you said in the email. You, you love that job. What was so spectacular about it? Was yeah. that here? Wh- no, was no, that? this was it was for the same school district. Uh, so during the summer, if you're a para educator. Uh, you don't get paid during the summer, and where is like this? a teacher does. This is in this was actually back in Wichita. I ended up moving back okay. to Wichita years and years after I left Kansas and thought I had shaken the dust off my boots. <laughs> uh, I ended up getting married and moving back to Wichita. Uh, so um, this was this was there, and uh, so a teacher uh, in that school district would get paid year round, but a paraeducator only gets paid during the school year, and so I would literally go work for the school district during the summer. Uh, going out and riding uh, on a riding lawnmower and just mowing like football fields and school grounds, which is they're huge, and kind of keep within yourself, really. Right? Yes, and, and like you're your hours own boss and, and hours. Well, I mean, we had a crew, but okay. like, yeah, hours of just sitting there listening to podcasts and music, and you can sing at the top of your lungs if you want to. Uh-huh. And nobody <laughs> hears you because you're on a riding lawnmower. Uh-huh. Uh, and these were these were top of the line riding lawnmowers. Nice. These were like. <laughs> hustler lawnmowers <laughs> like zero turn radius like this was like being in a yeah oh yeah boy. this is t- tim the tool man yeah, taylor's fantasy I, 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 I didn't know if you caught that oh, reference yeah. or not otherwise i'm just a guy over here next to the yeah. microphone <laughs> grunting for no apparent reason no i think everybody <laughs> our <laughs> age and older yeah. knows the <laughs> 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 good stuff okay so you mentioned getting married moving back to kansas yep. where did you meet your wife shay I actually met her in college. I met her at Northwestern, um, mm-hmm. and uh, she, <laughs> so she was she was um, she was not a music major like I was, but she was uh, she was in a lot of music stuff. She was in band, 
at the time I had this huge crush on her. <laughs> and so she told me at one point that she wanted to learn how to play piano. And so I said, oh, I'll teach you. And so I, I set this up where we would meet once a week for yeah, lessons. I see you working. Uh, yeah. Well, the best part about that is that I <laughs> I was n- in no way qualified to give piano <laughs> lessons. <laughs> How long did it take her to figure that out? Uh, well, two you minutes. Know, less I than don't one. think so. I, oh. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know if she under if she knew it at the time and just didn't say anything. Uh-huh. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I played a little, but I was not qualified to be a teacher. That's funny. And so, uh, but we did that for a while, and then she kind of went off her own way and i i didn't really see her like she was she's a little couple years older than me so she graduated uh the year that i started and um and then she just disappeared and Uh years and years later like 12 years later uh i am in new york city with heaton with andrew heaton yeah we had gotten a grant to make the the sketch comedy thing i told you about yeah yeah and so Uh we were at this dinner uh for that and i was there for the week and was my first time in new york city and you know all that so one night Uh, I'm sitting on uh, the balcony of Andrew Heaton's apartment. I may have had a few adult pops. Okay. Uh, (laughs) I'm familiar. (laughs) And uh, and I'm just kind of scrolling through Facebook, and all of a sudden I see her pop up. She had she had posted something, and we'd been Facebook friends for a long time, but I didn't really interact with her anymore. Mm -hmm. And you uh, you had run out of excuses like piano lessons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so. uh, I just kind of out of the blue messaged her and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I, I don't even remember what I where, said. Where was she living like, at the time? She was in Wichita. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She lived in Wichita. She, she grew up in a town very, very near where I grew up, uh, about 10, 15 miles away actually. Um, and, and then she ended up in Wichita. So yeah, so I, I messaged her and, and, uh, she didn't get it till the next morning. She tells the story. She, she literally dropped the phone on her own face because she she woke up and was looking up at her phone and saw that I had messaged her <laughs> and uh, yeah she probably won't admit it now but she, at the time she was like oh I, I dropped my phone on my face because I was so happily surprised uh, so, <laughs> yeah so anyway we started cool. talking and um, one we, thing led to another one thing led to another and we I I was actually living in Wyoming at the time. Uh, because wait a that's, How did we get from Manhattan to? Oh, you were just visiting Andrew, or wait? Yeah, I was just visiting Andrew. I, okay. w- I was not living in. in it's like New a temporary York. thing. Yeah, yeah. My where parents, in Wyoming? Sheridan, uh-huh. Wyoming. That's where my parents and my sisters now live. They've lived there for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and my dad's actually a state representative. I love Wyoming. Oh, I do too. Beautiful. Um, yeah. So sorry, I, I've got you uh, all over the map here. Oh, literally, right. literally. <laughs> <laughs> so you were okay. So you were just in Manhattan when you did the Facebook thing. She Correct. was in Kansas, but you lived in Wyoming. Everyone right. else confused yet? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, and eventually, what you you decide? Hey, I need to marry this woman. Yep. And very quickly. To, very yeah. quickly. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. How long? We uh, we dated very briefly, and then I was like, uh, I popped the question, maybe. Oh, I don't know. Five minutes. A later. month. I think. Oh. I think we made it a oh. month before I before I popped the question. That's great. And um, so then, yeah, we we got married. I moved down back down to Kansas, which I had thought I would never do. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, we got married. Shay uh, is my wife, and and she um, she had been married previously, and she has a a, a son, and her husband unfortunately passed away mm. uh, at a very young age. It was very tragic. So I. I, I love telling this story about about my wife. When I moved down to Kansas and we were, you know, getting prepared to, to get married, you know, she told me several times, she said, look, uh, m- you know, my son's not your responsibility. I don't expect you to take responsibility for him. Um, you know, he's my responsibility. I, I don't expect anything from you in that regard. And I and I just I said no. He goes with the he's he's part of the deal package deal. <laughs> he's yeah. a package deal. And so uh, I've been I've been a dad to him now for um, basically going on eight years. Nice. And uh, and because he's eleven now, so he is eleven now. He was he was just turning four uh-huh. when I first met him. Okay. Uh, and then if we have uh, we have a son uh, together also. So the the eleven year old is Christopher, and then our five year old is uh, Nicholas. And now Nicholas has autism. That's correct. He uh, he is on the spectrum. Okay. What kind of unique challenges does being a parent of an autistic child present? How that, much that, time have you got? I, I was going to say, because <laughs> I guarantee you, there's a lot of people listening that can relate to that. For sure. And, yeah. and I mean, what is, I don't know, word of wisdom or lessons that you've learned 
to help those that maybe are just newer parents mm -hmm. raising an autistic child because your son is five. It's it's funny. It is, uh, and I guess it varies widely depending on it where does. on the spectrum they are. Correct? Yeah, it's. Um, I, I like the way uh, Ben Shapiro talks about children. He says that uh, you know when you have children, your highest highs go higher than than they ever did before, and your lowest lows go lower than they ever did. Yeah, before. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah, and uh, I. I experienced that many times the thing i am learning because it is an ongoing process is um is patience is yeah. being a, a a more patient person and um some of the biggest challenges are things that when you live in the world uh the, this little crazy world of of, of raising an autistic kid a raising a kid with autism that's what you're supposed to say <laughs> I uh <-huh>. guess. <laughs> there's a there's a PC, there's, there's a <laughs> uh, there's a PC way to say everything uh -huh. um, it, when you're living inside of it if, if you can learn to take the things that are the most frustrating to you uh, and laugh about them even if you don't laugh about them in the moment you you and it helps if you have a partner if you have somebody who's helping you along the way and you can you can be so frustrated, but if ten minutes later you can laugh about it, uh -huh. um, it really does help. And uh, I I mean there have been sleepless nights uh, because one of the things about having autism is that frequently you know you have to deal with um, not being able to sleep. Mm. Uh, that drives me out of my mind, yeah. but. I'm also somebody who I, I spent several years suffering from insomnia. So I sort of draw on that. I understand what it's like to not be able to shut your brain down. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. <laughs> but it, yeah. And so I can laugh about it later, like right now. Uh, but, but in the moment it's very frustrating, you know, there, there, and there are a bunch of things like that. Um, you know, Nicholas is a, is a, is a very smart little kid sure but he's going you know he's he's doing he's doing life in a very unique way absolutely and uh, it seems like those with autism are always very intelligent it's just a matter of uh, focusing that right yeah i mean at least in my experience which is fairly limited uh, my wife shay is a uh, school psychologist oh. and so she deals with the every every level on the spectrum um, and she's, huh. she's dealt with it and she knows about it and she lectures me about it and all that. <laughs> so <laughs> understood. Okay. Tell us about some important individuals in your life. In addition to your immediate family, you've got a grandmother and your parents that have had major influences on you. Tell us For about sure. that. Uh, yeah. So, um, my, my grandma was, um, was a huge influence in my life. She was a, she was a very dear person she's uh the only person i've ever watched die which is a weird thing to say but that's that no, that I'm, is uh, the truth I'm with so, you. yeah it was, a, it was rough um i grew up i think she influenced a lot of my uh love for the arts mm. um a lot of my love for uh reading and writing and music she was a great lover of music she attempted to teach me piano i was gonna say Clearly, one of your one of your five possessions is her piano i still have her piano it has nice. been in our family for i believe around a century how often have you had to move with it several times and it sucks every time Isn't it fun? <laughs> <laughs> and and my wife uh refers to it by lots of colorful names and and plots and plans to get rid of it and I always say no. You can't do that. Right. Uh, it's gotta. It's gotta stay in the family. That's great though that, that she passed on that love for music and oh, the yeah. arts to you. How about your parents? So my parents. Uh, I'm one of those people who I really won the lottery in a lot of ways in life in the sense that I have really good parents who have been married uh, for. Well, let's see. I'm 37, so they just hit 40 years. I think this year. Mom, if you're listening and I got that wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but they've been married. Uh, they've been married forever. They they uh, they've literally and I, I am not exaggerating. I'm not. I, this is true. They have never spent a night apart. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's it's like a thing for them. Um, I'd have turned into a homicidal maniac by now, but it works <laughs> for them. Uh, they, they've had a policy, their whole marriage that was, uh, that if, uh, one of us ever has to sleep on the couch cause we're fighting, uh, the next day we're going to sell the couch. So, um, 
it's worked out for him. Uh, but no, they're they're great. Um, my dad, as I said before, he is a state legislator. Mm-hmm. My mom, she she is basically his brain. Uh, she's uh, she does everything that like she types all of his emails. She because dad does not deal. That's not with, for him. He does not deal well with technology for some reason. I just break things. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I understand. I understand. I got gotcha. you. Dad's, dad's a Luddite. He's, he's <laughs> like, I, it took until I believe this year, 2021, maybe 2020, before he got a smartphone. Mm. He carried a flip phone. He's one of those guys. Yeah, but there's there's part of me that, that on many occasions... <laughs> Wish that I just had a flip phone. Fair enough, but you wouldn't <laughs> actually like it if you did. No, no, you're right. But there are moments where you're like, Twitter's toxic. Of course. Why is this yeah, thing in my yeah. hand? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Back to our chat with Josh Jennings in just a moment. First, I want you to seriously think about the pain that you experience every day. And if there's a way to zap it, would you try that? I love the freeze gel from Dr. Monroe's. Because not only does it work, but it feels so good while it's working. The freeze gel from Dr. Monroe is as powerful as their signature Pro 8000 cream, which you might consider if you don't want the menthol scent that the freeze gel provides. Either way, I think you're going to feel so much better. When you head to Dr. Monroe's CBD.com, remember, when you make any purchase there, 20% of what you spend is going to help the Child Help Organization. They run a hotline for kids seeking help from abusive situations. So do some good for yourself and for others in need when you head to Dr. Monroe's CBD.com and don't forget promo code Keith. That promo code K-E-I-T-H, it's going to save you 15% off that order. That's Dr. Monroe's CBD.com promo code Keith. Let's get you some relief from your pain today. Okay. Piano. Yeah. Something you can do. You know, there's a piano out here in the hallway. There, there, there is I mean, now. I don't I know. Thought they took it away. Oh, did they? Oh, yeah, shoot! It's been gone. The Ukrainian one. The, uh, the, the you talking about the the upright piano? Yeah. That one is actually stored back in the storage room. I went to go see about playing it, but then yeah. it was behind some stuff, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to. Plus, I'm like, how many people died on this piano or something? Like, I don't want to mess with something that's a rel- like something. Right. You know, I don't want to make. Is that any, where it's from? Ukraine? I, have, I, I don't know. It I've seen. Something. There's a picture on it. Yeah, I gotta go. And look it looks quick. like. Nah, probably people died around I, there. <laughs> ah, boy. Okay. Well, I just do wondered. You, do you play the piano? I do not. Oh, okay. Right. I I, I, I play only, a little. It's the only thing I play is the Ooh. tambourine. Anyway, nice. That's, that's the extent of my abilities right there. Okay, you you're, you strike me as a uh, you're a part of the worship team kind of guy. <laughs> wow, you definitely don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a negative. Ship, ships passing in the day, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. No, no. Oh, no. Okay. So uh, you also play guitar. Uh, poorly, yes. Okay. Well, uh, let's see here. You do some fishing. A little fishing. Yeah. 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 I didn't do that. got to be good in Wyoming when you visit your parents. Uh, you, I've never fished in Wyoming. Well, Whoa. I, I don't think I have. Um, I didn't get into fishing until about about the time that, I, that we moved here down to Texas, mm. which was about a year ago. When I first got here, because the pandemic was still going on and they weren't really letting us come into the studio all that much, you know, I had a lot of extra time and I was like, well, what am I going to do with myself? And I decided, well, maybe mm. I'll try fishing. And so yeah. I've been fishing for a year, and I have caught nothing. I was about to say, pretty boring, right? It's, and it's hot, and it's miserable, and it's gross, and yep. you sweat, and it's stinky. And, yeah. and if you're me, you, you end up just uh, launching that hook into your uh, eye socket. Right. Uh, thereabouts. You know what? You're alone. There are no kids. Uh-huh. It's peaceful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had it accurate. So you said peaceful. I don't know, man. Uh, just that. I don't know, man. I'm just not good at it. And I'm, yeah. Well, I'm not I have, good at it either. I don't catch anything. Yeah, I just, but I've learned that I, I am not an outdoorsy guy. I was much more into the outdoors when I was younger. Sure. And I think it's because I had friends that could really handle all that stuff. You know, like they'll pitch the tent. They'll start the fire right. i'll just sit here and <laughs> you just chill, enjoy you yeah. know so okay i uh, and, and i will say but now texas, that i'm a dad texas no texas <laughs> is also like it is a it is a whole different ball game going i went camping with some friends yeah. a few weeks ago worst mistake of my entire life i'll never do it again yeah uh not in the summer anyway that's not right in texas yeah that's, God, but see, my, my son is of the age where he can handle all of the stuff and even at that i don't enjoy it 
Whereas yeah. when I was a teenager and somebody was handling all of that, I did enjoy it. Now I'm just like, bro, I make mortgage payments. <laughs> I pay electric bills to sit inside the air conditioning, okay? I don't need to be out here. No, thank you. Let's pitch the tent in the living room. Right, right. So anyhow, you've got a dog. you got to tell me about Poppy the Velcro dog. This Poppy the fun. Velcro dog. Uh, Is it because he just hangs out and won't leave it, you alone? It's you, well, she, and yes, kind of. Uh, she is a cockapoo, so she's half cocker okay. spaniel, yeah. half poodle. And um, we did not have a dog uh for our entire marriage and i would always kind of grouse about it and be like i don't want to get a dog and like i know someday the kids are going to want a dog but i don't want another dog because i had dogs growing up and i loved them but they always die <laughs> and, I, I tell you man that is you're speaking my language that, yeah it, it's and always like, in the back of your mind uh, yeah like, and you know it's it's gonna happen it's gonna be awful it's yeah. just ugh. and so and then you uh, start to see him slip a little yeah and then you're thinking why did I do this? Right. But boy, we don't deserve dogs and they are so worth the uh, ride, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. So about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, my my wife uh, texts me from work um, and she's, she shows me this picture of this, just this looked like a Brillo pad mutt. <laughs> and uh, she's like, somebody's giving this dog away. Uh, they, they, she, it's a young dog. It's only a year old. She, um, she needs a lot of attention and these people work crazy hours, weird hours. And so um, they just can't keep her because mm -hmm. they're, they're having to kennel her all day and that's not fair. And I'm like, and she's like, can you call these people and see if the dog's still available? Oh, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is your idea? Woman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like, oh, I don't want a dog. I was like, okay. But then I forgot to call the people. Uh, so it almost didn't happen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and she texted me later uh, uh, after lunch or something. And she's like, did you call those people? I was like, oh, no, I forgot to. Uh -huh. I did I did call them that afternoon. I got you. I got and they you. said, yes, the dog's still available. And so she went and picked up Poppy uh, on her way home. And she said, you know, I, I knew the moment I saw her, this is my dog. Mm. And I had the road to Damascus moment, too, because when they walked in the door and I saw her, I'm like, Oh, that's a, that's my dog. Okay, and so that's we've awesome. we've had her ever since. But yeah, she is the neediest dog uh, I have ever met. She <laughs> she she when she wants to be petted, uh, it does not matter whether you want to pet her or not at all. She will come up to you. She will nose under your hand and push your hand up until you are petting her whether you give your consent or not. I love it. I love it. I <laughs> so, love it. So. And she loves to sleep in bed with us, which drives me crazy. Mm. But I can't. I, okay. I can't kick her out. Yeah. Well, small dog. I'll, I'll allow. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. She's but, pretty small. But we have a big dog that no. Yeah. And, and he he's so intelligent, but he doesn't understand. It's like, what's the deal? Why can't I get on the couch? <laughs> she can. Why can't I get in the bed? She can. Well, Life, life's unfair when you're a big right. dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you get you get more walks than she does. Okay, uh, right? bro. You know. So there's a trade off. Okay. Favorite book you've read is I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Is this what the Will Smith movie was made from or no? Yes, okay. it is. So is uh, it, it, tell me, does the movie do it justice? It does in the sense that the book was written, I think, in the 50s. Oh, wow. And so the movie that, that they did with Will Smith is very, very updated to be okay. yeah, more sure. modern. And I love the movie. But it's good. How, I will say this. There was a – it's not the first version of the movie. Really? Yeah. There was a Vincent Price movie called The Last Man on Earth that was based on that book as well. And it's from, I would say, the 50s or 60s. Um, and it's actually pretty good too if you like older films. Uh, it's very different. And and um, I will say the 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 Will Smith movie does it justice in the sense that it's a good movie. I I think that if you didn't know that they were connected, though, you might not make the connection because the novel is more of a vampire novel than mm. than even what the movie. Mm. Kind of the movie kind of presents these creatures as as basically humans evolved into something more predatory and and dumb, mm -hmm. um, whereas in the in the book the the well, actually that that does sound like our society right now. Yeah, yeah. Humans are becoming more predatory and dumb. <laughs> yes, very very <laughs> very prescient. We're we're on the cusp, y'all. I am legend. You heard it here first. That's right. Oh, but okay. and maybe last. Yeah, right. Right. It depends on. 
<laughs> the rate at the at the speed of which this society is degenerating, this podcast may not post by the time that right. I am legend becomes reality. We, we may all be we, out. We all may all be outdoorsmen by then. <laughs> you watch some of these TikTok videos, you think, man, we're already there. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. boy. Okay, so uh let's see here. We mentioned this earlier. The five possessions you'd like to keep, your grandmother's piano, guns that your father gave me, these are all excellent. First dollar bill you ever made as a writer, uh, your uh, own zombie novel, signed by Max Brooks, who inspired it. I'm not familiar, I'm sorry, but it sounds That's like okay. You, you know his father is Mel Brooks. Well, I sure do. Yeah. So now we got it. Okay, Yeah, Max cool. Brooks is, is his son, and he's uh, he wrote uh, yeah. The Zombie Survival Guide and a book called <laughs> World War Z. Yes, I'm familiar yeah. with these and titles. he gives, he gives, uh, he gives um, or used to give, I don't know if he still does, he does uh, sort of these sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, mm -hmm. zombie survival lectures. He'll travel around and give them like at colleges and stuff. And oh, I, cool. Yeah, I attended one and I, I took my zombie book with me and I was like, can you sign this? And he's like, what? I said, you inspired it. And so he, he wrote Not Written by Max Brooks uh, on there. <laughs> that's funny. That's good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh. The old Bible that your grandmother gave to you when you were a kid. How old's that book? It's very um, old to me. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was probably new when she gave it to me. Oh, okay. um, so it's not like a it's not like the not family, family Bible heirloom or anything. Yeah, like it okay. doesn't weigh eight hundred pounds. I got gotcha, you. Yeah. I got gotcha. um, No, no, no. But the, but but she gave it to me. Um, and the the cool thing about it is that uh, if you go through, she used to underline things uh, uh, with a with a pen throughout, uh, like things that, that stood out to her so i can go through there and mm -hmm. i kind of get a sense of her you know where her mind was at at this time yeah that's interesting you say that because my grandmother uh, nana an earlier uh, episode here on at the mic show mm. and by the way you can find all these episodes at the mic show.com if you're not familiar uh, and, and if you're just catching this this show for the first time please please go listen to it it, is, it is fantastic you are i i say this it was no <laughs> no you. flattery intended i'm <laughs> telling you you are one of the best interviewers i've ever heard on a podcast wow it's really good that's very kind of you to say i appreciate that right. um, you can pay me afterwards yeah oh absolutely the check will bounce however <laughs> that's all right okay but i would love to see when i at some point you know when that time comes and i'm looking at her bible i could do this next time i visit her though i would love to go because she spends every day in the Bible, mm -hmm. writing stuff in the margins and stuff. But it's funny you said that. I never thought, you know, I should go and read that stuff, uh, what she's writing. That, yeah. That's a good point. And I, I look forward to being able to do that at some point. So earlier in the program, we discussed the little demons at the end of the Snow White ride. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> well, tell us about an encounter you had, which you swear was a face to face encounter with a demonic being when you were 14 years old? 14, yeah. What happened, uh, man? We moved, uh, this was when I lived in Ark City, the place that's 45 minutes south of Wichita, unless you want to get a ticket. <laughs> we we moved to a house, it was a big two-story house that my parents got for a, for a song. Mm. Um, and uh, it was what they call a fixer-upper, and it definitely was a fixer-upper. Like, I think maybe some animals had lived in this house. Uh, definitely some people who were living a very weird life. Uh, there were places uh, in the carpet downstairs where fires had been built. Like What? Yeah. Like, uh, fixer-upper. More yeah, like yeah. <laughs> a homeless encampment. More, more like bulldozer-downer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> bulldozer-downer. <laughs> but we, we, we moved in there, and my dad, um, who's a very handy-type oh, fella, cool. he fixed it up over the course of, of I think, about a year. And uh, so the downstairs was where we all lived, and the upstairs had been a, um, a boarding house. So the upstairs was kind of divided into, I think, three separate sort of little apartments. And uh, one of those, and I, I, I bring this up because it, it ties, maybe ties into the story later. One of those, um, somebody who, who had lived there had written all kinds of dis weird satanic stuff all over the walls. Like there were pentagrams and weird that's just weird. stuff, just bizarre stuff. My parents went in and uh, painted over all of that, and like my mom went through the house, like reading a Bible out loud or something, like to to cleanse it or something. I bet. And then, uh, yeah, when I was fourteen, I woke up in the middle of the night. You know how there's there's, there's kind of two ways that you wake up. You either wake up slowly and kind of groggily, or you snap awake because something like brings you instantly to consciousness. So this was the latter. I, I was like dreaming about baseball or something, and the mm -hmm. crack of the bat like woke me wide up. 
and I noticed a glow, like a glowing in my room. Oh no! And I, I kind of, I looked up to my closet, and there, like floating in the, in the, just in the middle of the room, was uh, this disembodied head. It was like it, the skin was stretched over the skull, like it was very um, thin and uh, had like dark black hair, and it bared its teeth at me. Oh. I, I remember this so vividly. I mean, I'm I, I'm literally I'm 37 now, so I'm literally more than twice the age that I was. Almost coming up on three. And you times. have no doubt that you were wide awake. I've had doubts over the years because that's a pretty horrific thing to see yeah. and be able to live with it and not have some part of your brain go like, yeah, but did you really see it? Uh-huh. And so uh, it bared its teeth at me. And uh, what kind of teeth did it have? Have it fangs had, or what? Uh, all of its teeth, upper and lower, were about an inch long, razor sharp, and. Ugh. And they had like the iridescence of like pearl. That's how vividly I remember this. And um, it was between me and the door. And so I just, I don't know, I knew I wasn't getting out of there. So I did what any self-respecting 14-year-old would do and threw the covers over my head and turned my face to the wall (laughs) in terror and prayed that it would go away. Mm. Uh, Eventually I had, I got up enough courage to, to look and it was gone. And I went, I got up, I went to my parents' room, I woke them up. I think they thought at the time that I had a bad dream. How long had you been in this house at this point? <sighs> um, I would say less than a year, Okay, uh, I think. but I, It I wasn't like it was... night number one. No, 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 like... no, no, no. It, it had been a little while. Um, so here's where it gets really crazy, because right. that's, yeah, <laughs> this is one of those stories uh-huh. that just keeps on giving. Yeah, 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 the, uh, the disembodied head floating, glowing in your room with the fangs that are an inch long. Yeah. That's not... That's yeah. That's just a that's, that's an appetizer. That's the appetizer. Oh no! Uh, you might want to fast forward if you have a little kid with you. By the <laughs> yeah, way, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, said... this is pretty scary. Yeah. Um, I found out later that going back as far as I could go with my family, every generation has had some sort of experience like this. Wow. Um, something very similar or or almost exactly the same. My parents experienced something like this on their honeymoon. Uh, they were at a hotel and they woke up and they both woke up at the same moment in the middle of the night. And um, there was a there was a like a f- the reflection of a face in, a t- in the TV that was something inhuman. Oh, my. My grandmother, when she was a little girl, she woke up one night and looked out her window and she said there was a gray man there who was not a man. She didn't know what he was, but he was evil. So we have stories, uh, and that's as far back as I could go because my great grandparents are all are all passed away. Right. Um, but, but who knows? Right? Who knows? Who yeah. knows? And uh, I was I was actually engaged to a girl once. Um, obviously, didn't get married, but we we were engaged for a while. And um, uh, she also her family had things like this. And so it's like it, it's like it, like I'm. Uh, you know who without, the common denominator is yeah, in all this, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Man, I'm about it's to wrap this interview yeah, up. Right, get out, run, get out this room. Run. <laughs> um, when I was in my 20s, uh, I lived in Norman, Oklahoma, for about 10 years, and I had an apartment. I was um, out to go see a movie one night, and I came home, and I locked my apartment door. I locked the deadbolt, and I put the chain on. And I know I did this because my apartment, a few months before that, had accidentally given a new tenant the key to my apartment instead of his new apartment. Okay. So I got walked in on by somebody while I was changing clothes. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. They can't show up while you're watching a football game. Right, no, right. no. They got to show be... up while you're naked. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Okay. So ever since that moment, I had always made sure that I not only locked the deadbolt, but I also put the chain on. Okay. So I know I did that that night. I hadn't been drinking. Nothing like that. You, you had just come home from a movie. Came home from a what movie. What movie was it? Oh gosh, I don't even remember anymore. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Just curious. If I thought about it, I could probably yeah, come up with yeah, it. But yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I was trying to figure out if it was you know Poltergeist or no, something like gosh, that. No, gosh, no, 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 no. I, I, it was nothing like that. Okay. So, uh, I, I, I get home. I lock the door. I put the chain on. I go to bed. In the night, I dreamed that there was somebody lying on the floor next to my bed, and that they got up with a pillow and blanket and walked out of my bedroom and presumably out of the apartment the dream you know this was a dream well uh oh you tell me <laughs> oh no here we go the next morning i know where this is going. i woke up i walked into my living room bro the bolt the deadbolt was un- unlocked the chain was undone 
and on the floor of my living room oh. was a pillow and a blanket. Okay, so hang on. <laughs> no, no, let me play, and pun intended, uh, let me play devil's advocate yeah. here, okay? <laughs> so you thought you were dreaming. Yeah. It turns out it was probably real based on the physical evidence. Literally the only plausible explanation would be that I did it myself in my sleep. Okay. Like, All if, right. like if I got up and staged this thing sure. somehow. Yep. But in what my I w- sleep. what I was getting at is what about in Kansas you swore it was real, maybe you were asleep. Now I'm not doubting anything you're saying. Sure, sure. I'm just flipping it like here you thought you were sleeping, maybe it was real, maybe there you thought it was real but you were sleeping. Right. I, I honestly and I don't doubt anything that you're saying. Sure. I'm just trying to convince myself that, uh, <laughs> that none of it was a demon's right. <laughs> not going to show up in here before I can get this interview done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will say this, like the, 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 whether or not I was dreaming or, or somehow hallucinating in some fashion, believe me, first of all, when I tell you, I would love it if that was the case. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it is. Cause I think I've never experienced you don't believe that it, I, I don't believe that it didn't happen, or that it, that, yeah, that it didn't happen. I think it really did. You're talking about 14 year old yeah. Josh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I have no idea about 20 something year old Josh. Like, I don't yeah. know what happened that So, you day. haven't had any weird encounters like this for 15 so years? No, but I also, but I'm very, very careful what I allow myself to think about in the evening before I go to bed. I too. bet. I bet. Uh, you're not, you're not up uh, late at night listening to Coast to Coast AM. No, and all no. Because that <laughs> that's what I listen to a lot of times driving into work, you know, at three in the morning. Yeah. There's some fun stuff on there, and you hear stories yeah. like this. Yeah, and um, I, I'm very careful about that. But the thing that bothers me in terms of, like, I think I might have been able to at some point say, well, maybe it was just a dream or something like that, right. except that it's happened in my family over and over and over that's again. That's true. Yeah. Throughout the generations. And it, like, Why that's do you guys crazy think you're a target? You know, I wonder, I, I actually wonder if it's something genetic. I actually wonder if there's a if there this is just a little pet theory of mine. Oh, let's hear that. Um, that maybe if there's this is assuming a lot that there's you know this the assuming that there is a, a um, um, sort of metaphysical realm. There's something beyond what we can see, which mm. I presume there is. Maybe the people who are able to see some of these things are able to see them because of some genetic anomaly. Mm. that runs that maybe runs down through family lines or something like that it's 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 just a thought i mean it's it's really just, almost like a supernatural antenna built into your dna yeah like yeah that. and believe me i would prefer that other people had it i do not and and i've not encountered anything besides what i've just told you mm-hmm. so i don't know but yeah it sucks it's, it's the scariest thing i've ever been through and full disclosure I went through a pretty long period of time. I told you earlier I, I dealt with um, insomnia. Yeah. That's why. Mm. That's why I dealt with insomnia I was bet. because because I would go to bed every night and be terrified that I was going to have an encounter again. And uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, and, and listeners out here, don't do the same thing I did if you have an encounter. Um, I, I, I had a pretty serious alcohol problem for a while that – was I mean I could tie it to a lot of things, but it, that was one of the major ones. Was hey, this helps me go to sleep without being terrified. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, that's um, that's a rough patch. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I I I can't imagine. Um, I will be putting a disclaimer at the front end of this. Uh, that's a good uh, podcast idea. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. for uh, <laughs> I'll say you might want to skip between this part of the podcast. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, that's there 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 is another dimension. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and, and if it bleeds into this one, who knows, right? Yeah. So let's go to the good side of spirituality and, yeah. you know, happy thoughts, Christianity. How did you become an Eastern Orthodox Christian? That's Cause the only thing I know, and you correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. The only thing that I associate with that is like Christmas and Easter, like the dates are different, right? That you celebrate? Uh, that's, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, well... Yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. It depends, um, right? It depends. Yeah, uh, from year you. to year, yep. the, the calendar on uh, for Easter changes. Sometimes it's on the same day. But wait a minute. Is Christmas not like uh, into January or something? Or? It, well, that, that I was going to say, so for Christmas, it, we still, the, the there's still the Christmas day, um, but there's like, December you, you know the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas? Yeah. That's where that comes from because it, it's, a, it's a feast. It's a, it's a like multiple days long feast. But I think that one is always set at the same time every year. What January seventh or something? Yeah, it goes until then. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, I get. But I got but, you but, but we, you know, we celebrate Christmas along with 
Protestants and everybody else on the twenty fifth. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. but it's but it's a long feast. It's well, that's kind of yeah. cool. You get more days. It's like so. Jewish members of the audience and Eastern Orthodox Christian members of the audience get like this long stretch, whether it's Hanukkah or the twelve days of Christmas. Yeah, but or here's the fun part: run of the mill Christians, we just get the one day. Yeah, but the catch <laughs> is you got <laughs> leading up to that forty days before the Nativity or, or Christmas. Um, is is a it's a forty day fast uh, where you don't eat any animal products at all. Okay, not cool. <laughs> no, nope. yeah. I'm Same out. Same thing with Easter. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. It's a it's a it's a rough go. I got you. Um, so as with most of the things that have gotten me in trouble in my life, um, Eastern Orthodoxy got introduced to me through Andrew Heaton and a girl that I liked. So. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, Andrew Heaton actually used to be Eastern Orthodox right. as well. Right. We, we've talked about that on yeah. this podcast. So I was in college, and uh, I was I was raised in a very, uh, very religious home. We were- um, uh, Like uh, evangelical? Evangelical type. type mm-hmm. Protestant. uh, Protestants, yes. And if you've been around that or if you're in that, you know that there's Yeah, kind being of a, born and raised in the South and uh, right. Southern Baptist, uh, definitely have. Yeah, you're very familiar then. <laughs> um, so- you know then that that the kind of um, lodestar, the 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 thing that everybody wants to do is is to get as close to the the biblical church that you see in in the New Testament um, as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, I was raised in that. I was raised believing that that that's always the goal is to get back to the basics, back to the beginning, back to where things were supposed to be before they got all corrupt and. Mm-hmm. And you got back to what the Byzantine Empire? Yeah, <laughs> pretty <right>? much. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I didn't. I had never heard of Orthodoxy. I had, didn't know anything about it. I had seen Fiddler on the Roof, and there's some Orthodox <laughs> people in there, but I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and when I met Andrew Heaton, uh, I knew he was Orthodox, but I didn't know what it meant. I thought he was just kind of a weird Catholic. Um, <laughs> but then there was this girl that I was interested in, and she got interested in it. And uh, so then I, of course, had to learn about it. And we were the only two people. Uh, this was in, this was in college. I, I was interested in several girls in college. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um, anyway, we got this uh, person to come and give us uh, classes, like teach classes once a week uh, on the Northwestern campus. Mm-hmm. And we were the only two people who, who went to all of them. And um, what I found out was that, you know, the, the Protestant – Faith, as I understood it, was something that had diverged basically from the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation. I knew about that. Uh, What I didn't know was that if you then went back, you know, another 500 years, the original Christian church, just as it was known, had split in 1054 AD. And uh, it was basically the Western half of the Christian faith and the Eastern half of the Christian faith. And so the Western half went on to become what we know of today is the, the the Catholic church mm-hmm. and the Eastern half went on to basically was the Orthodox church as we know it today. So what I found out, you know, going through all these classes was that the early Christian church, you know, was comprised mainly of Jews at first and they were Jews. They, they practiced Judaism. Even when they became Christian, they practiced Judaism, uh, which is a, you know, uh, if you've ever been to a to a any kind of a Jewish um, uh, temple or or anything like that, if you see their services, it's very um, liturgical, mm-hmm. very responsive, and 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 things like that. And so that literally is what these early people having you know the churches in their homes because they were being persecuted. That's what these church services looked like. They were liturgical services. They had this order and structure um, that. Protestantism, because Protestantism, you know, unfortunately came out of Catholicism, which had gotten so corrupt, they kind of... Martin Luther. Yeah, yes. And unfortunately, they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater. They're like, well, we don't want any of this, uh, you know, hierarchy or bishops or things like that. That that mm-hmm. all smells like Catholic uh, to us. <laughs> and so they threw it all out, uh, mostly, and uh, which I understand. But, um, but anyway, so discovering orthodoxy was discovering like this is what the church looked like at the beginning and it and it has not changed down through the years very much at all mm. for 2000 years you know you have this kind of unbroken line of doctrine and 
uh, and a hierarchy and and you have these so did the eastern orthodox church did they have like um the equivalent to a pope for catholics no and that's one of the reasons why the church split um was because um there were uh, what are called patriarchates which is uh these bishops um but the western or sorry the eastern understanding of christianity has always been that christ is the head of the church uh-huh. and so there can be no pope there can be no one person who mm-hmm. rules the whole church. And in 1054 AD, the bishop in uh, Rome said, uh, no, 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 you guys all answer to me. And they said, no, we don't. <laughs> um, Bye. Th- this is, yeah. <laughs> and, and so they, they split, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't uh, uh, mend their differences. And so they've been split ever since. No, I got you. I mean, the Jewish members of this audience, they get eight days with Hanukkah. You guys get, what you said 12 days of christmas yes yeah, yeah and and by the way it is uh not <laughs> that's not like um <laughs> it isn't like every single day there's presents under the tree oh well i'm out now <laughs> i was thinking <laughs> or at least i've never experienced that <laughs> maybe maybe like orthodox okay. uh, parents who really love their children uh, right, do that right. but my parents are, are protestants so, so it's not such a stretch when when you say hey do we get to open a present uh, no, we you still don't do that I, I actually so so to be fair my my wife is protestant uh-huh. uh and so we have a um we we have a mix of traditions like we don't um okay like we we do a lot of things the protestant way and a lot of things the orthodox way mm-hmm. and it's it's it works <laughs> it's kind gotcha. of a weird mishmash but uh i we we go to i i split my time going to her church sometimes and um i'm i'm you know i'm i'm a lot more when i first converted to orthodoxy yeah how long was, ago did you do that i was 21 or 20 oh wow so it's been a while yeah 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 uh, and when i first did it, i was militantly like you know everybody should convert to orthodoxy and you guys are wrong all this mm. and i that's burned out of me i'm I'm, yeah. a, I'm a shattered husk of a man uh <laughs> and i'm like i don't care you right. guys all love jesus I, whatever well, yeah let's um, move on yeah, yeah exactly. but it is um yeah it's it it is a um, it's been a very interesting and fulfilling journey well, that's to cool. be Orthodox. That's good. Okay, so if you could go back in time, uh, a lot of people mentioned Jesus in their answer. Um, yeah. Uh, you mentioned Michael Crichton. I specifically didn't mention Jesus because everybody says that. Right, right. No, I, no, I no. would, of course. That would be my number one. Is, if you, okay, so if you could ask Jesus one question, what would it be? Putting you on the spot here. Oh, man. Only one? Yeah. Ooh. Only one, and then then the line gotta keep moving. It's like you're at a, a at a at a at a public event here, and Jesus is sitting at a table, one that he probably had just overturned. Right? No, he's sitting at the table. <laughs> people are filing through. You can ask one question of Jesus, and you couldn't eavesdrop on the people in front of you or behind right, you, so you right. have no idea what what's being asked. There's a lot of rules to this. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of rules here. <laughs> uh, he's in a phone booth, actually. Yeah, he's not yeah. at the table. You, you can think get of, in the phone booth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can think about it. You can come back to it. Uh, no, 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 no. I think I know what the question okay, would be. Okay, what do you got? Because uh, I have no idea what I would ask him. It's a bit of a downer, but like I, I would probably ask him, like, can you really lay out for me in a way that I will that I will fully understand? why it is necessary for so many good people to suffer in the world Mm -hmm. you know i've heard lots of answers from lots of people but i would love to hear it from him yeah yeah uh check out the book by uh uh, ravi zacharias why suffering i would love to good stuff yeah i'll look that up good stuff it really truly is yeah uh i'd probably say hey how powerful was that wine at that wedding? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Michael. That's a good question. Yeah, Michael Crichton. Uh, yeah, but Baptists don't want to hear the answer to that. Right? They okay. do not. They I can do say not. that. I was raised Southern Baptist. Back off. Okay, hold on. Uh, let's see. Michael Crichton. Yep. Probably a big influence on you and your wanting to write. Big time, yeah, mm-hmm. for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but also, like, the main thing I would want to ask him about actually has nothing to do with writing. I would mm. want to ask him. He was in the early aughts, one of the only people who were famous who uh, stood up uh, and said um, this this whole global warming thing, because it was still called global warming and not climate change back then. Right. Um, this whole global warming thing, it's probably happening on some level, but it is not a catastrophe. And wow. he got crucified for that did not realize that he was in that camp oh yeah there if you go on youtube Mm -hmm. unless of course they've pulled it down um, (laughs) you can find uh speeches that he gave um 
Uh, in fact, I want to say he may have even testified before Congress at some point oh, about it. Really? But uh, but he yeah he gave entire speeches on it. He wrote a book about it uh, called State of Fear, which I highly recommend. I've heard that so many times. I, I it's, shame on me. Yeah, it, you should read it. It's a it's a bit of a slog. It's not his best written work in terms of plot and and, and dialogue and so forth. But in terms of his approach to the to the issue of global warming, um, it's pretty uh, eye opening, and yeah. I would want to ask him about that. If he were still alive today, would his views have changed any? Given given mm. the the you know the the data in the interim, um, yeah. yeah. By the way, Michael Crichton, the only person like the only famous person I can think of uh, that I cried when I found out he died. Mm. Yeah, that was very sad. Very I sad you. day. Well, um, I'm seeing that there are speeches that he's given. I don't see anything with Congress on here. It doesn't mean he may not have that. Mo- that might be in my head. Okay, but <laughs> but when you do search Michael Crichton, uh, global warming, mm-hmm. um, you get a a, a context uh, Wikipedia context link there on climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, of course you do. Thanks to YouTube. So yeah. just heads up uh, on the that. The best the best thing you can do uh, if you're interested in this the the best introductory thing I think is he did an interview with Charlie Rose uh, back when Charlie Rose was that's on here had, yep. hadn't gotten me too yet uh, or whatever it was that happened to him. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and uh, it's a really good interview, and it's a very good introduction to to kind of his take on it. Okay, so good to know. I highly All recommend right. it. State of Fear, Michael Crichton. Yeah. Uh, also, you want to go back and meet Plato. Yes. Um, why Plato instead of say I his teacher? I literally just want to ask him if Socrates was real. Okay, that's what I, I was just about to ask you. Uh, so, so you don't want to talk to Aristotle. You don't want to talk to uh, uh, Socrates. You want to talk to Plato. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, I think I, because um, <laughs> because I would really love to know, and of course I would want him to explain the Republic to me uh, uh, in, in a in a way that's more satisfying to me intellectually than I'm capable of wow. creating on my own. You are a nerd. Yes. yes no, I, I mean am. that. I mean that with love. I, I do. <laughs> no, I do. No, no, I seriously right. do. Um, okay. I, I like this. Any regrets you'd care to share? And your response was, it took me far too long to learn that you can be ambitious and content at the same time. What do you mean by that? That's well said, but what that, do you mean? That is one of the, I have a few core tenets by which I live that, that are mostly things that I did not learn until I got a little bit older. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm sure that's the true for everybody. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, yeah, so I told you, I, I when I was 10, I knew I wanted to be a writer. It hit me one day, just, oh, this is what I want to do with my life. And so everything from that point forward became about writing a novel and then, and then publishing it and being a published writer. That was my thing. That was what I wanted. And that is a really hard uh, business to break into, mm-hmm. as I found out year after year after year after year. And um, and that's good to know, because now I don't feel so bad about giving up on my dreams of, you know, uh, publishing a screenplay. Well, you know, hey, you know what? It's too hard, so I'm glad I didn't waste my time. No, okay. So. <laughs> no yeah, so, I mean, it is hard. It's, yeah, it, it, I've it's, heard that from a lot of people. Yeah, you write... Uh, short stories and and or novels and then you go through this process and i think it's changed in the last decade or so um but but when i was really doing this on a regular basis i was sending out query letters to agents and you get rejection letter rejection letter rejection letter Uh, i had one agent in probably 10 years worth of trying to do this one agent who was like i'm interested what do you got i told her what i was working on she said i like this project what do you got on that? And I said, I'll I'll finish it up and give it to you. And I did. I wrote an entire novel based on her saying, I like this idea. Uh, I sent it to her. Didn't hear back. Didn't hear back. Didn't hear back. Finally, like I emailed her. Still didn't hear back. Months go by. I email her again. Finally, she's like, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I sent you an email. It must not have gone through. Uh, yeah, I, I decided to pass on the project. <laughs> I'm like, I wrote this. I took a year of my life to write this book. And then another year of my life waiting on you to talk to me. Bother with a phone call? or (laughs) I bet you checked your spam filter. Everything. Where's the junk mail on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All all She never sent it. Probably not. Or or if she did, I mean, who knows? She might have sent it to the wrong email address. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I I was, you know, a small fish in her world, and she was a very, very big fish in mine. And so somewhere along the line, 
you know, you, you get busy doing other things in your life. Mm -hmm. You are working your job. You meet, you know, the woman of your dreams and get married and then you have children and then life just, you know, I used to think I was immortal. I was like, that's something I'm supposed to do. And then I had, you know, my first kid and I'm like, Oh crap. That, that, Mm -hmm. that was probably it. I can probably die now. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, your perspective changes as you go through, through all these things in life. And at some point I finally realized, Oh yeah, that goal, I can still go after that. I'm still, I I'm writing a novel as we speak that I'm, I'm hoping to, to publish within the next year. Uh, God willing a lot sooner than that, but we'll see. Um, I'm writing a novel right now, so I am still pursuing that dream at mm-hmm. 37. But it can't, it cannot absorb every bit of my waking time. Yeah, and it also cannot be so important that I cannot be happy without it. That's good. Yeah. I have kids. I love. I, I love the time I spend with my kids, my wife. Um, I have hobbies. Uh, I suck at fishing, but I like it. You know, all these things. It, it really is just a. It basically boils down to something as simple as saying, I will be a positive person even if I'm 37 and I haven't, you know, got that New York Times bestseller yet. Even if I never get a New York Times bestseller, because at this point I've, I've achieved a weird level of, of success in my own life in mm-hmm. that. Ironically, I write things that millions of people hear. <laughs> <laughs> they just nice. don't know it's me. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, that's the final step is like, let's get to the point where some of those things that I write, people do know it's me, uh-huh. but it's okay. It's fulfilling. It's fun. I like life. I like I, if life is fun. I like people like you that I get to talk to on a somewhat regular basis when we actually do <laughs> see each other and say hi. Yeah. Um, I like, I like just, I, I am enjoying life more because good, I man. don't allow that, um, that that uh, ambition to get out of its cage. So no, that's, that's that's a very long winded way of answering no, your question. No, no, I got it. I got it a lot. Hang on a second. I'm gonna try to. As uh, as the poet of our generation, Bono says, you know, <laughs> elevator music guy, um, ambition bites the nails of success. Mm. Huh? You, yeah, you oh, ruminate on ru- man. ruminate on that one, and I guarantee you, the next time we pass in the hallway, yeah. you'll change your tune on Mr. Elevator Music oh. Bono of you too. I'm just gonna claim that he stole it from Bob Dylan. Oh <laughs> no, I, 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 that is actually really. Uh, that's nice. I you like that now, don't you, huh? Uh, uh, I yeah. swear, if you turn me into a U2 fan. Okay, well, you're going to start by listening to a song called The Fly. Okay. And that's where that lyric appears. It's on, uh, well, the greatest album of all time, <laughs> Octung Baby, which I'm sure you've heard of. So uh, you, you know I have, of yeah, course. Absolutely. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, anything else that we've... Oh, people can find you on facebook right yes it's the josh a, jennings fan page there is yes is that what you it's, type into the search going, i don't, yeah, I don't I do facebook so. so i don't know yeah it's it's the josh jennings fan page um and that's that's kind of where i i am slowly moving to a point where i am putting my my private facebook keeping it more private and uh-huh. not like it's more like family and close friends and things like that okay and then i'm i'm trying to whatever Whatever um, public image that I'm putting out there, I'm trying to just put on that page so that it just keeps things separated, you know. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I'm nowhere near famous enough for that to be relevant right now. Oh, but stop. I'm trying to get okay. I'm trying to get uh, get it set up for the future. And that's the place they can find you: <laughs> Facebook, yes. Josh Jennings fan page. Yeah, you, nowhere else. And and literally, well, so I think I may have some things on Amazon, and that would be under J M Jennings, which is what I used to oh, write under. Nice. But um, I think it's just short stories that are up there um <laughs> but i will as i as i get future projects out i yeah. will be putting them uh on the fan page you'll you'll see everything there that you need to see at some point i'll probably get a website too but i'm i don't need it yet okay we'll get there <laughs> i love it i love it very cool well your homework assignment is to i would just recommend you just uh you listen to the entirety of the u2 album octung baby and then uh pay special attention to track number seven so do you like the album that got put on everybody's iphones 
Uh, which one was that? Because I don't have an iPhone. I um, don't know. I tried to get it rid of it. I tried to delete it, <laughs> and it came back the next uh, time I updated my phone. Oh, Songs of Innocence? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That actually is a very underrated album. Um, in fact, it features um, Licky Lee, another uh, artist that I enjoy. Oh, I like uh, Licky she, Lee. She's on a, on a track on there um, as well. There's uh, a possibility. That's uh, Licky yeah, Lee, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. From yeah, the Twilight movies or whatever. Oh, no. Was it really? Yeah, it was in one of them. Oh, yeah. now. I'm sad. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> that's a good song, though. Yeah, no, and that's not even among her best. So, uh, anyway, Josh Jennings, thank you so much for making time today. Uh, check him out on the uh, uh, Facebook fan page. Keep track of all that he is doing. I appreciate you making time today, man. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. I loved it. Absolutely. It was fun getting to know Josh, and I'm going to admit that 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 talent of opera singing of his I was not expecting when I invited him in for a conversation that was a fun treat if you've also enjoyed your time spent here I hope you will please consider rating and reviewing this podcast in Apple iTunes and subscribing to it wherever you listen I would be so grateful all the platforms that you can get this podcast on are all in one handy location. Head to at the show.com check out the merchandise as well that we offer at at themikeshop.com. You got the Christmas giving season right around the corner and the official show merchandise is available at themikeshop.com. Hey, coming up next week is another talented guy, my friend Brad Skistemis. You may know him better as Five Times August. He'll be here for a fun interview about his interesting life. That's next week right here on At The Mic. Well, thanks as always for stopping by and for spending time with us. I hope you'll head back this way next week as well. But until then, please go be free and thank you for listening. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Head to atthemikeshow.com for archived episodes, sponsor information, and ways to connect.